Well, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. And you can turn to Acts chapter 2. I think we'll begin with the scripture reading and um, then we'll go to Lord in prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Okay, you just need to pray. (laughs) Or you're going to have to endure this for 40 minutes. Suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. Father, I just pray as we turn our attention now to your word that you would speak to us, speak to our hearts and lives, illuminate our understanding. I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that we're reading about here, that, Lord, you would give us illumination and understanding of what you intend for us in this passage, I pray. Lord, I ask you to do your work in each one of our hearts. We submit ourselves today to the authority of your word and the scripture. We want it to have rule and reign in our lives. And so we receive now from your word and ask that you would accomplish your intended purpose for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the crowd that gathers here asks a question, and I felt just playing on that, it might be good to just divide this message up into a series of questions. So that's what we're going to look at, uh, just the number of questions this morning that I think help us get at the intent of this passage. And I think will help us not only in our understanding, but in what are we supposed to do with what we're reading here. The first question they ask is, what does this mean? Look at verse 12. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? So this event, something is happening that they don't quite understand. And they're asking immediately, what does this mean? Dan, if you'd help me just a little bit, pull that volume down just a tad for me, thank you. And and that's the right question. They want to understand what is this that is happening right now? Um, what we know is that what's happening here, and we're going to look at it through the message this morning, but we know that what happens here is the new covenant promise of power and power of the Holy Spirit is being fulfilled in this event. That's what we're reading about today. We read uh, in the previous chapters how Jesus promised that when the Holy Spirit comes, they would be filled with power and they would be witnesses He's promised that. He promised that in the book of Luke. That's the way Luke finishes 
his first volume. And now that new covenant promise, Jesus has has died on the cross. He's been seen by a multitude. He was buried, seen, raised from the dead, seen by a multitude, and he was taken into heaven. That's the way Luke begins Acts. And now he pours out this promise, this new covenant promise of the Holy Spirit. That's what's taking place here. And we know that that's what's happening, that the Holy Spirit is coming in power by what we read about here. We read about the wind, and we read about fire, and we read about these strange tongues that, that settle in on people, and, and there's, there's no doubt that the Holy Spirit is coming and that he's coming in power. Now, I say to you that that's the new covenant promise, and the Holy Spirit did come in the Old Testament with power, but he would come occasionally upon certain individuals. The Holy Spirit came upon, and we don't have time to track all of them. I, I, in, in studying this very thing this, this week, uh, I just thought I'd grab a couple. Samson is one of those that just makes it very obvious. On a couple of occasions, the scripture says the Spirit of God came upon him. On one of those occasions, don't turn there now, but Judges chapter 14, verse 6, he rips apart a lion with his bare hands. Not because he was this massive guy that you see in your Christian cartoons and Sunday school classes, perhaps, but he was an ordinary individual that the Holy Spirit came upon, and he, it says he tore that lion apart. Another time, he killed a thousand men. Let me read this one for you from Judges 15. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and he put out his hand and took it, and with it struck 1,000 men. I mean, this is the best superhero you could think of. The spirit rushes upon him. He grabs this dried-out white uh, jawbone of a donkey and he kills 1,000 men. Not because he was a major warrior, not because he was, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger of his day. <laughs> he, it was because the Holy Spirit rushed upon him and enabled him. So you see in the Old Testament times when the Holy Spirit would come on individuals to accomplish something specific in the purpose of God. Numbers chapter 11 is just one more that we'll mention. And that's when God took some of the Holy Spirit that was resting on Moses and distributed it to the 70 elders. Moses had chosen these 70 elders to help him. And it says God took the Spirit that was on Moses and put it upon those 70 elders. And you remember what they did? They prophesied. And Moses said then, I wish that all of us... <laughs> could have that spirit of God, could prophesy the same way. And so we see from time to time in the Old Testament that that spirit would come. So it would come in power. Now the reason that's important is this. The disciples, those waiting together in that upper room for the promise of Jesus to be fulfilled, knew what they were expecting. They were anticipating that kind of power. Because when the power came in the Old Testament, it was, it was something major. It was an exciting opportunity. There were powerful displays that took place. And so they knew the implications of that when Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You say, well, how do we know that's what's happening here? Well, that's our second question, and we know that because the Apostle Peter says so. Now, I don't want Josh to panic because he's preaching this passage next week, but I've got to dip in one verse of next week's passage, just enough so that you will know. I'm not going to preach his sermon. That's the fear we all have when we're doing series, but uh, 
this one verse, when Peter stands up to explain what's taking place, he's answering the question, what is happening? In order to do that, he, he uses this 600-year-old prophecy of Joel. He quotes the new covenant promise from the prophet Joel in Acts 2, verse 17. Look at it there. And in the last days it shall be God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, Josh will tear that apart. He'll use that in the message next week. Suffice it today to say why we know that this is the new covenant promise is because Peter says this is the fulfillment of Joel's new covenant promise. In the last days, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pour out my spirit. And so we know that what's happening here in today's passage, that this event is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in new covenant power that Jesus had promised. That's what's going on. That's what Peter basically says. Here's what's happening. This Joel 2 is being fulfilled, this new covenant promise. They would have understood that, that the promise of Joel was there was coming a time when God was going to pour out his spirit, not just on certain individuals, not just on kings and priests and the you know, the prophets, he was going to pour his spirit out on all flesh. And this day of Pentecost marks that turning point in history. It marks that turning point in redemptive history. It's a transition from the old covenant activity of the Holy Spirit to the new covenant activity of the Holy Spirit. And church, the reason that's important is because you all know we are living today in the new covenant activity of the Holy Spirit. And so what we're reading here is what we are to be experiencing and be a part of our lives as well. Now we know this about this new covenant outpouring of the Holy Spirit is it was more powerful activity than even in the Old Testament because of the volume, because of the breadth of it, because his spirit was poured out in an amazing way. And we're going to see later that Jesus tells us, we know it's better because he says, it's better for you that I go away because then you'll receive the spirit. And so it's more powerful in its outpouring. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know what he's really saying to them? Because they would have had this Old Testament background. He's saying to them, when the Spirit comes upon you, there's going to be power, and ripping apart lions with your hands is is not a big deal. (laughs) That's Old Covenant Spirit power. Uh, Killing a thousand men with the jawbone of of a donkey is going to be nothing. This new covenant power is going to be power to accomplish the mission and the purpose of God in a very powerful way. We know also this new covenant activity of the Holy Spirit is inclusive. It's inclusive. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now that certainly means all redeemed flesh, all of God's children, God promises that it's not just the prophets, priests, kings, and judges. Now, all of us can receive the Spirit, can receive the power of the Spirit. So this day of Pentecost is a monumentally monumentally historic day in the life of the church and in our lives because it's the dawning of new covenant spirit activity. And we're going to see, as we make our way through the rest of the book of Acts, the remainder of the book of Acts is going to be a study in what does that power of the Holy Spirit, new covenant power, what does it look like? We're going to see the disciples experience that power of the Spirit as deeper intimacy with God, this personal uh, walk with God. They experience this Holy Spirit power as greater power over the influence of remaining sin in their lives. We're going to see some dramatic changes in the life of Peter, for instance, from before this outpouring to after this outpouring. 
it looks like a Jekyll and Hyde at times. It's like, is this the same Peter that's just denied Jesus? We're going to see that kind of change in people's lives as a result of this new covenant power in their lives. We're going to see in just a couple of weeks that they experience profound fellowship with one another. There is power and victory over the devil. There's a wider distribution of the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to see that in the book of Acts. There's going to be a breaking down of all the barriers to the gospel. So no longer just to the Jews, but now, and we're going to see it even today in today's passage, that people from all over the world are now hearing the good news. They're hearing about the great and mighty acts of God. So the day of Pentecost marks this remarkable event in this remarkable day. It's the day that the Holy Spirit began to function among God's people in a new and a more powerful way. And the best way I can describe it is new covenant power. So you have the Old Testament work of the Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful study for you if you're looking for Bible study. Study the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. But you're going to see, as of the day of Pentecost, the rest of this book of Acts shows us a distinction, not in the Holy Spirit, same person, the Holy Spirit, same third person of the Trinity, but his working and his power now in the lives of people is going to be different, and we see some of those differences as we progress through this study. So third question for us is, why, why Pentecost? Why do we call this, why does it start that way on the day of Pentecost? Why did God choose this particular festival of Pentecost to fulfill this promise? Well, the answer, and we can't know fully, of course, the timing of God, but one of the things we do see and do understand is there's a beautiful symbolic significance to this day of Pentecost. See, a lot of us, if you, like me, were raised in a Pentecostal church, and that was kind of my background, it's like whenever I read the day of Pentecost, I'm only thinking one thing, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but you've got to remember, these individuals gathered here would have had great Old Testament understanding. And when the day of Pentecost came, it meant to them, this is the day of harvest festival. This is one of our big, you know, the best, best way we can remember it is those of you that have been a part of a celebration in the past where all Sovereign Grace churches would kind of get together and have this several-day celebration. The, this was one of the big feasts for the Jewish people. And it was the Feast of Pentecost, Pentecost, by the way, simply means 50th, and that's because this feast, Feast of Harvest or Feast of Pentecost, one in the same, it took place 50 days after the Passover. So Passover they would celebrate. 50 days later is this harvest festival when everybody would gather together. It's a feast of harvest, Exodus 23:16 tells us about that. We won't turn there, but if you want that reference, it's referred to as the Feast of Harvest in Exodus 23, 16. This feast, by the way, is a pilgrimage feast, and you want to understand this. It was a celebration, but it was a celebration where everybody would journey back to Jerusalem from all over. And that's exactly what happens. That's what we read, by the way, in verses 9 to 11. We read this very list of a very diverse group that is gathered in Jerusalem. Why in the world are these people there from all over the world? It's because the Feast of Pentecost was a pilgrimage feast. You came back to celebrate in Jerusalem together. And not only is it a pilgrimage feast, but it's one of the best attended feasts one of, the, one of the best attended pilgrimage holidays because it takes place in June when they would have good weather and it was good for travel. And so this was a big festival in their minds and people would come from all over. So now get the significance of this. Jesus pours out his spirit with new covenant power and 3,000 people are harvested for God at the Feast of the Harvest, at the day of Pentecost. 
um, God gathers this large group of diverse people in Jerusalem and he pours out his spirit and he gathers in this harvest of souls, 3,000 people just initially. I mean, the significance of this, of, of God in so many words saying, I'll fulfill this new covenant promise on the Feast of Harvest because this outpouring of the Spirit is going to mark the first fruits of a great harvest that's going to come. I'm going to pour out of my Spirit and you will be witnesses. And when that Spirit comes on us, there's going to be a great harvest of the gospel as it goes forth, and we're going to trace that through the book of Acts. We're going to trace that through Acts as it spreads bigger and bigger, and God's mission expands and expands. Look at verse 2 at what he says happens here. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound, notice this, like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And I think that's important. They're trying to describe what they're hearing and experiencing. And they said the best we can do is it sounds like a mighty rushing wind. They hear this sound. Now, now understand these followers of Jesus that had gathered here, they've got categories for these kinds of things. See, our imaginations in the 21st century are our imaginations fueled by Hollywood, right? We've got to see the, uh, the graphics. We've got to see the, you know, details of it. We don't, we don't cultivate imagination much, but these folks would have had their imaginations fueled by the Old Testament. So, of course, the sound of a mighty rushing wind would cause them to think it's coming from heaven. It would cause them to think God is showing up because in the Old Testament, regularly there would be wind and the sound of wind, the roar of God's presence when God would come down to his people. They had categories for this kind of thing. It would be as though their response would be, well, of course. <laughs> when we read of God showing up in the Old Testament, many times there was that kind of sound. Not always, but often there were those experiences, those tangible expressions of sound and sight, and they had categories for this kind of thing. God was coming down to his people, and look at verse 3, and not only did they hear a sound, but and divided tongues as of fire. Again, like fire, they didn't say there was fire burning everybody's hair. They said somehow it looked like there were divided tongues of fire upon each of them, and they describe it, best way they could describe what's happening, as tongues of fire. Now again, that sounds strange to me. Sounds mysterious perhaps, may sound a little bit weird that you're in this prayer meeting and you can see some kind of manifestation, and the best way you can describe it is it looked like there was fire over everybody's head. But again, they would have had categories for this. Fire they understood. It was a symbol of God's presence, oftentimes in the Old Testament. God appears to Moses, how? In a burning bush that doesn't burn up. God leads his people in the Exodus, he leads his people by a pillar of fire. So regularly, God's presence is seen in this issue, in this uh, item of fire in many different ways. The same was true on the Mount Sinai. It was a consuming fire. They said God is like a consuming fire. And so they would have had categories for the sound and for what looked like fire. Of course there's fire in Acts chapter 2, because God is coming down to his people in new covenant power. He's coming to illuminate their minds. He's coming to open them and give them understanding of the glories of Jesus Christ. He's coming to warm their hearts. So, of course, it, it would contain this kind of a manifestation. His people, and God is visiting them Notice another piece of that. Of course, the fire divided and rested upon each of them. 
This is no longer the pillar of fire or the mountain on fire. This divides upon each of them. And again, what is part of the fulfillment of the new covenant is that the Spirit of God would now rest upon all of us, not just particular individuals, but all of us as believers, that the new covenant promise of power would be to each of us. There is an individual dimension to our walk with God, absolutely corporately as the church, uh, a, a, a part that we can't eliminate from our walk with God. But part of the new covenant blessing is this individual intimacy with God for everyone who believes. And part of that new covenant promise is this power, the power of the Spirit is going to be upon all flesh. Look at the last part of verse four, or first half, excuse me, first half of verse four. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So what's happening here is God's new covenant promise of power is being fulfilled. And the language makes sense here. The language of infilling makes perfect sense in light of what God has promised would be a part of the new covenant promise. Part of the new covenant promise is that God would put his spirit within his people. That's part of what Joel had prophesied, what other Old Testament prophets had looked forward to, that he was going to put his spirit inside of us. And so he would take up his dwelling place with us. And so it makes sense that here, as this promise is fulfilled, we read about it in the terms of being filled with the spirit and in filling. He fills the disciples with his Holy Spirit. And again, it's as though these 120 would say, well, of course he does. This is the new covenant being fulfilled. And he's promised that he would fill us each individually. He would live within us. The disciples do something, by the way, in response to this filling. It's found in the middle part of verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. Now just stop right there. Don't go too quickly on. But they began to speak. So the next question I want us to ask is, what do they say? They're speaking. What are they saying when they're filled with the Holy Spirit? And the answer is in verse 11. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty work of God. Can you imagine what that would have been like? This harvest festival, people from all over the world, at least the known world then, have gathered together, speaking multiple different languages, thanks to the Tower of Babel. They're speaking all these different languages, and they hear this sound, no doubt the rush of a mighty wind. They hear something, and they gather together, some 3,000 at least people, gather together to see what's going on. And as they are, the people there are filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak, and these individuals from all these other countries are hearing them speak in their own native languages. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So the answer to the question, what did they say, is what? They said the mighty works of God, the greatness of God of God just came spilling out of them when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. By the infilling of the Spirit, they experience this greatness of the presence of God. We sang this morning a couple of those songs that just talk about, I want more of you. I want to experience more of you. And that's partially what happens here. When the Spirit is poured out, there is a greater awareness of the presence of God. There is a closeness. And they begin to express the greatness of His presence, the greatness of God. It just spills out of them in praise and worship. I mean, really, a literal translation of verse 11 is that they were telling the greatness of God. That's what they were doing. They were telling the greatness of God. 
Well, how did they know the greatness of God? It's because the greatness of God has come close to them. With the pouring out of the Spirit, they were aware of His close presence, and out of them just spills forth praise and worship. And I think by that we can take, at least in some sense, to mean that being filled with the Holy Spirit is being overwhelmed by the greatness of God's presence. I mean, we can describe it a lot of ways. That's not a, an all-inclusive definition, okay, of being filled with the Spirit. But the thing this passage tells us is when they were filled with the Spirit, they began to speak about the greatness of God. There was something about His nearness, His presence that just spilled out of them. And that's exactly what happens. When the Spirit is poured out, praise happens, worship happens. They're expressing this to others in languages that they didn't know. Look at verse 4 again, the full verse. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So when the Holy Spirit filled the disciples, he enabled them to speak languages they didn't know. I thought how much the Snyders would love to have some of that. <laughs> They're going to have to work hard. God's going to help them in learning the language. But could you imagine the Spirit coming on them the day of Pentecost and they begin to speak in languages that they don't even know? It's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. It is, by the way, uh, what the spiritual gift of tongues is all about. It is uh, the ability that God gives by the Spirit to speak in languages that we don't know, at least unknown to the speaker. It's giving the ability to pray or praise God in syllables and languages that are not understood by the speaker. That's what the gift of tongues is. That's what accompanied this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that's what accompanies many ongoing events through the book of Acts when individuals are filled and filled again. This happens oftentimes in their lives. The point is this, the speakers don't understand these languages. It is a supernatural act. It is evidence of the power of the Spirit coming. They had no explanation of it. And these were actual foreign languages. Look at verse 7 and 8. And they were amazed and astonished. Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it we hear each of us in his own native language? They don't know how to speak our language. They knew these individuals were from Galilee. How is it? Being from Atlanta, they can speak Thai so fluently in ways that we understand. We know where they're from. We know they haven't been to language school yet. I mean, that's what's happening here. See, because we know the big picture of what's happening, that God is pouring out of his new covenant promise, we know what's happening on this day of Pentecost, we can say, well, of course, they speak in languages they don't understand. The Holy Spirit has been poured out in power. The gift of tongues here is symbolic of this new unity of the Spirit for God's people that is going to transcend race. It's going to transcend nationality. It's going to transcend languages. Uh, many of the early church fathers, by the way, would, would make the connection for us that what happened on the day of Pentecost was the separation that took place at the Tower of Babel by languages is in many ways turned back or reversed. Not that we all speak the same language, but it was that confounding of languages by the power of the Spirit is done away with. Now again, we still have those languages today, but it's the point that God's power was able to reverse the, 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 uh, the effects of that, and people were able to hear in languages that they knew, their own uh, national language. They were languages that the speakers did not know. And what happens here is that the power of the Spirit enables God's people 
to bring the message of the gospel, and it will continue to do this, to give us the ability to bring the message of the gospel to every tribe, to every people, to every nation, and the barriers to the gospel are broken down. That's part of the symbolism of what's happening here. Remember, till this time, it was to the Jews. To this time, it was within the nationality of the Jews. But as of this day, it's evidence that the gospel is spreading to the ends of the world, as we've seen as our mission, and that's evidenced here by the fact that all of these other nations, many of them that are gathered there, are hearing about the greatness of God from these individuals filled with the Spirit of God. Church, the point of this is the day of Pentecost is a monumental, it's a historic day that affects, it affects the entire world and it affects us. It affects you and me today and that's what we need to know. We've talked in the last couple of messages each week, we've said you've got to see yourself in the book of Acts. We're that continuation when Acts stops in Acts 28. We pick up. So you've got to see yourself here. Don't, don't read this as just history. Read this as part of the new covenant that we participate in. In fact, here's what Charles Spurgeon says on this point. From the descent of the Holy Ghost, and I love how he says that, old King James language. From the descent of the Holy Ghost, that was before ghost was an unpolitically correct word, but that's... King James spelled it out that way for years. The Holy Ghost, from the descent of the Holy Ghost at the beginning, we may learn something concerning his operations at the present time. Remember at the outset that whatever the Holy Spirit was at the first, that he is now, for as God, he remains ever the same. Whatsoever he did then, he is able to do still, for his power is by no means diminished. We should greatly grieve the Holy Spirit if we suppose that his might was less today than in the beginning. We may reckon, we may expect to see the like or the same spiritual wonders performed among us at this day. Now, let me just say to you, he is not saying and I am not saying that we repeat the day of Pentecost over and over. I'm not saying that. Spurgeon didn't say that. He said the likes of this, the power of the Spirit, that same Spirit that was poured out on that day is poured out in our lives today as well. And we're going to see in the rest of our study of Acts that the Spirit, these individuals that are gathered together in this room and are filled with the Spirit are not filled one time good for all. They're going to be filled again in chapter 4, again in chapter 10. It's going to be an ongoing event where Peter is filled with the Spirit and he stands up to speak. We'll see next week. And so over and over again, this filling of the Spirit is going to happen. And that's what Spurgeon is saying. That's what I'm saying, that we've got to be a part of this book of Acts and see ourselves in this book. And really, this brings us to our application today, lest this be history. When we read the book of Acts, when we read Acts 2 specifically, we can't merely read it as ancient history, far removed from us till it becomes completely irrelevant. We're just reading about something that happened. When we read Acts 2, we must see ourselves in this chapter. We must do business with Acts chapter 2 today. We're meant to be in this chapter. It's the promise Jesus made. When the Spirit, when the power of the Spirit comes on you, you'll receive power to be my witnesses, to carry out the mission. Every one of us, every believer in this room today are children of the new covenant. And this new covenant promise is open to us. It has been fulfilled. They were told to wait for it. There's no longer any need to wait. It's happened. The Spirit has been poured out, given to us, and so now it's simply up to us to enter into this and experience refillings that we're going to see throughout this book be filled over and over again with the Spirit so that this power is there for mission. 
And so as we're swept up in God's plan, the wind of Pentecost, God, uh, as part of the new covenant, uh, God intends us to be spirit-filled, spirit-controlled believers that experience the nearness of God and experience the power of God for mission. This is why Jesus told his disciples in John 16, 7, that it was to their advantage that he go away. Because the new covenant promise is going to promise you a nearness of God that you could not know before that. Jesus said, and, and typically, I think in our finite minds, in our simplicity of minds, we think, oh, it'd be so wonderful to have been with Jesus, just to walk with him, be one of his disciples. Do you believe the Bible when Jesus says, it's better for you that I go away, because when I go away, I'm going to send the Spirit? It's better for you that the Spirit empower your life than you were to walk with him in the flesh here in this life. Now, I understand the, you know, the romance of that picture, of just being with Jesus, spending time with him. I, I love that our hearts are drawn to that. But let's believe God's word. And that is that the power of the Spirit, the new covenant blessing of the Holy Spirit being poured out is to your advantage. It's better for us than it was for them. That's exactly what he's telling us here. The question is simply, do we believe that? Do we believe that? He's pouring out power to witness in a way that was unknown before the day of Pentecost. And so, the most important question out of this text this morning is not one that we've already asked. It's not what's the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the being filled with the Spirit. Those are questions we'd love to answer for you. They're not the most important question in this passage. Or what exactly is the gift of tongues? It's an important question. It's just not the most important question in this text this morning. The most important question is this. What is my current experience with the Holy Spirit? Where am I in the book of Acts? Am I aware of his active presence in my life today? The Holy Spirit's been poured out. The new covenant promise has been given to us where are we in that experience with Acts chapter 2 today? He's been poured out, so we ought to expect he would work in our life. We ought to expect that there would be visible, audible, tangible manifestations of his presence that we are aware of. Even as we're going to see in the rest of the book of Acts, it's going to become very clear that the Holy Spirit makes himself visible, makes himself, makes us aware of his presence. And so the question for us is, where are we in this experience of Acts chapter 2? Here's what I would say to us. If we're not aware of his activity, if we're not aware today, not, not if we can't point back to a day somewhere in the past, but if we can't today say that we are experiencing his active, empowering presence, then we need to do business in searching our hearts and our lives as to why that is. The reason I say that is this. We have to search ourselves because the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, don't turn there, just write that reference down, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, the Bible tells us it's possible to quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can quench the Holy Spirit through sin. He is, after all, the Holy Spirit. And so if you think you can have the active presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and regularly engage in ongoing, unconfessed sin as though it didn't matter, uh, let me help you understand the Holy Spirit is quenched by our sin. We know that. He's quenched by sins like self-sufficiency, as we talked about briefly last week, when we have a sense that we just don't need the Holy Spirit, I can live this Christian life just by trying hard. I don't need a particular power to be a witness. And so we just self-sufficiently live our lives that quenches and grieves the Holy Spirit. 
We quench the Holy Spirit by ignoring the desperate need we have for more of God. We can quench the Holy Spirit through neglecting means of grace, which would be our regular reading of Scripture, prayer, fellowship, confession of sin, worship, attending church. We can neglect his means of grace and in so doing quench the Spirit. So here's my point, not to point out in your life where you're quenching the Spirit or even that you are, but to at least raise, since the Bible says it's possible, that you do business with the possibility if you're not experiencing the active presence of the Holy Spirit today, I think the best way to deal with that is search your heart before God. God, are there areas, Holy Spirit, are there areas where I have quenched you and dialed you down in my life, where I have made you insignificant in my life? Are there areas where things in my life have quenched your activity in my life to the point I, I don't fit very well in Acts 2, much less the rest of the book of Acts? The bottom line is the spirit can be quenched. And the good news is, however, uh, if, if you right now find out and as you examine that you've quenched the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2 is really good news for you. The good news is that the Holy Spirit has been poured out. He is available for your life. You can receive power to live the Christian life. You can receive power to, to live as a witness for Christ. And if you're not experiencing that, if you'll examine your heart as to have I quenched the Spirit, the good news is, through confession of that, there is forgiveness of that sin, and we can reignite, in a sense, the work of the Spirit. And that could well be what happens where these individuals are filled right here, and then in chapter 4 again, and then they pray again, and it happens again, and we see over and over again this work of the Spirit in their lives. I'm going to ask Manny to come, and I'm going to close with this. And we've gone a couple minutes over partially because we worshiped a bit longer and we don't want to shorten that up so we just want to give God opportunity but we're going to invite you at the end of this meeting to come and to pray we just think it's a good way to close this morning so here's the invitation to you if this passage stirs a hunger in your life for a more powerful work of the Holy Spirit the invitation for you it's just come and be filled. If, if you're dry and you're lifeless in your walk with God, the invitation is come and be filled. If you're sensing that you need power for mission, power for witness, if your serving has become a drudgery and you're just doing it in your own strength, then come and be filled. If you lack passion, for God, if it's routine, if you're some way bored with your Christian life, just come and be filled. The one thing you're going to see in the rest of this book as we study is it's anything but boring. <laughs> there was nothing about Acts that you could describe as, as boring. So if your Christian experience is that, the invitation to you is to come and to call upon God for more. Remember we said last week what these 120 were doing they devoted themselves to prayer. So one of the ways to encounter this experience is as we have this week, devoting ourselves to prayer, and even today, before we leave, devoting ourselves to prayer. Would you stand together with me?